I want to say just a couple words as, as we begin. Um, and, and that is, uh, uh, and this is a serious, well, last week we talked a little bit at the beginning about, uh, uh, you know, healing and our nation and things that are going on. And my, my challenge to you tonight um, is regardless of your politics, regardless of your, uh, whether you lean left or right or Republican or Democrat, is I think all of us have a, uh, a role to play and a responsibility into just to try to provide healing for our country and, and as we move to the future. And so I think everybody has a chance to do that in their own uh, context, in their own way. Um, uh, and, I, and so uh, I'm going to start us off with a word of prayer. But my, my challenge to you is to think about as Americans, and we're called to be Americans first and then Republicans and Democrats or Libertarians second, how can we help move uh, our country forward? Whether you voted for Joe Biden or you didn't, um, we all have a role to play in, in providing hope and healing. And so let's, uh, let's begin with a word of prayer and then we will uh, we'll get our class going. So join me for prayer. Yeah. Loving God, uh, thank you for this time on Wednesday night with, with dear friends uh, in Nashville and beyond. Thank you for Rubel. And uh, for his many decades of ministry and teaching, for the insight that he brings and the passion that he has for scripture and for teaching. And, uh, and tonight, as we talk about things that are theological, uh, thank you for his insight and uh, for his willingness to be with us. Uh, today, we uh, inaugurated a new president. And so I, I pray for all of our nation's leaders, uh, both on the right and the left. I pray for our outgoing president. I pray for our new president. I pray that we can all do our part to provide hope and healing uh, in this country as we, uh, as we look ahead. Uh, grateful for uh, technology that brings us together in a time when we have had to remain socially distant and apart uh, a very long period of time. We pray for all those who are battling COVID, those that have lost loved ones to it, and those that are lonely and missing their loved ones um, because of it. Be with us tonight. Be present during this time. All this we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So the, uh, the, the title of this class is Christianity uh, uh, Post-Corona. And we've been kind of talking about what is uh, Christianity going to look like whenever we get out of this period, this COVID period. And we don't know exactly when that will be. We assume that it will be gradual, uh, stair-stepped as more and more people are able to get their vaccines. And it's good to see that a number of people on uh, on this call have already had their first vaccine. Oh, many more of you will soon. Um, but we're, we're thinking about how uh, COVID-19 coronavirus has impacted Christianity, church life, not just temporarily, uh, but also for good. And so what we said last week is that tonight we want to uh, come back and, and, and talk about this from a theological uh, point of view and ask some of the difficult questions uh, that come up during a time like this, like where is God in a pandemic and why can't God stop the pandemic and how is God acting and moving during the pandemic? And so uh, Ruben and I've talked and I want to share um, a passage from John's gospel. It's actually the same a text that I shared a couple of Sundays ago with uh, with Tulu uh, when we were when I was talking to Tulu. So this is John uh, chapter nine, uh, beginning with verse one. As he walked along, he saw a blind man from birth, and his disciples asked him, "Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind?" And Jesus answered, "Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed." In him, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back and was able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? And some were saying, it is he. Others were saying, no, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. 
But they kept asking him, then how were your eyes opened? And he answered, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes and said to me, go to Salome and wash. And then I went and washed and received my sight. And they said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. So Rubel, lots of people, when we go through uh, seasons like this, difficult times in life, uh, a pandemic that's taken the lives of uh, over 400,000 people in this country, uh, millions of people uh, worldwide, they ask the question, where is God? Uh, why is God allowing this to happen? Why doesn't God show up and stop this? Well, let's talk about these questions, uh, because I think that these are important questions for all of us to wrestle with uh, as people of faith as we live through this time. So I'll turn it over to you for your thoughts. Boy, how's that for lighting the fuse and tossing it in a guy's lap? Um, I'm, I'm sure I don't have an answer that's going to satisfy everybody. But let me begin um, with a broad answer and then go to the text. And, and I know the reason Clay read that is because I said, Clay, I have a different take on John 9. I think it's, I think it's punctuated incorrectly. And because it's punctuated incorrectly, the theology that comes out of it has been poor. But let, let me go, go back just to the first broad question and then go to this text. Uh, where is God during this pandemic? Well, number one, God didn't send the pandemic. Um, I know that because God is good. Um, James 1 says, every good and perfect gift comes from God, with whom there is no shadow that's cast by turning. There's no variation. There's no that bad things don't come from God. Um, God doesn't give people cancer. God doesn't make pee -pee, uh, people have babies that are born with spina bifida or Down syndrome. We live in a world that is fallen. And in a fallen world, uh, there's sand in the works. And because there's sand in the works, uh, things, this is not the Garden of Eden. Once we left Eden, we started polluting our environment. Uh, we started polluting the genetic pool. We started polluting, polluting, polluting. And, and a lot of the physical things that are going on in the world are here because everything from the air and the water down to the gene pool uh, bear the curse. And because of that, things happen in the world that would not have happened in the world if Adam and Eve, you and I, had not brought sin into the world. So where's God in the pandemic? Number one, he didn't send it. Number two, um, he's grieving with us. He's a loving father. Uh, he's grieving with people who have, have lost loved ones to it. Uh, he's agonizing with people who are in hospital beds. Uh, he's agonizing with their families if they're unconscious and on ventilators. And he's grieving uh, that, that we are suffering. Good fathers do that. And then you go to the, to the larger question then, well, is God active in this? Uh, what, what can God do in it? What does he want his children to do? And that's why I brought John 9 into the discussion uh, this afternoon when Clay and I were talking on the phone. And I, I didn't really tell him what I was going to say about John 9. I said, I've just got a take on John 9 that I'd like to put with the class. Um, let me start this way. Translation is tricky at best, and translation of the Bible also involves reading interpretations into it. Uh, the notion of a literal interpretation of the Bible uh, or a literal translation of the Bible, you, you just can't do it uh, because you, you gain and lose when you go from one language to another. Mm -hmm. Any of you who've studied any language know that. So, the, the critical part in John 9, I'm going to read it as literally as I can translate it from Greek. And then I'm going to show you some, that some things are in the translation Clay read 
the NIV that I usually read from. I think you're probably reading the new RSV. Yep, an RSV. And, and, then, and then I want to show you the point that I think is in the text that's critical. Here's the way I would translate as close to literally as you can. Rabbi, who sinned this man or his parents that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that God's works might be known in him. It moves us or behooves us to work the works of the one who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. Okay. Um, that's, that's just pretty wooden, pretty, pretty literal. Now the question is punctuation. There's no punctuation in the Greek text. Most of you probably know there's not even spacing between words in the Greek text. The oldest Greek texts are all capital letters. About the fourth century, they're all lowercase letters, and there's no punctuation. There's no spacing between the words. So punctuation is a part of a translator's interpretive process. Okay, here's one way to punctuate. It's the way the King James Version punctuated it, essentially, and it's the way the translations in the tradition of the King James Version still translate it. And that would be the New International Version. It would be the New Revised Standard Version. Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents that he was born blind? Question mark. Okay, good punctuation mark. Don't question that one. Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, comma, but that God's works might be known in him, period. It behooves us to work the works of him who sent me while it's day. All right, with that punctuation, listen to what Jesus is saying. This man isn't blind because somebody sinned and he's being punished for it. God made him blind so I could come along today and heal him and do a miracle and everybody would say, hallelujah, praise God. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, comma, but that God's works might be known in him. I think that's not only a bad translation. I think it is a theological slight to God. God doesn't blind people. God doesn't kill babies. God doesn't cause car accidents, planes to fall out of the sky. I would change the punctuation in only one way. I would put a period where most translations have a comma and a comma where most of them have a period. And here's how it would read. Rabbi who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind, question mark. Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, period. Next sentence but that God's works might be known in him or seen in him, comma, it behooves us to work the works of the one who sent me while it's day. Now, let me tell you why I think that's theologically important. The disciples of Jesus had the same idea that a lot of people have today. If somebody's suffering, God's getting him for something. He's being punished. So if I get the flu, if I have a heart attack, if, if I die of COVID-19, I wonder what he did that God made that terrible thing happen to him. That's not the God who is revealed in the Bible and who shows himself in Jesus. He's light and darkness doesn't come from him. The question these disciples ask, assume that, that, that it's karma. Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he's born blind? If somebody's blind, it's because God's getting somebody. Jesus answers flat-footed. Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he's born blind? Jesus said, quit thinking like that. Nobody said, not the man's parents, not the man. Nobody sinned that he's blind. Now then, because he is blind and we're here, let's do something to help the poor guy. I think that's the question, would my Christian or Rubel Shelley or John Doe, who is a believer, should ask 
when his neighbor gets COVID. Well, I wonder what Aunt Sue did that God gave her COVID and she died four days later. I think that's a horrible question. Mm-hmm. Um, God, God, God doesn't go out killing Aunt Sue with COVID because, oh, back when she was 27 years old, she's 82 now. When she was 27 years old, she had a nasty thought or um, uh, she cheated on her husband or she uh, stole money uh, at the church bazaar. And so now then God gives her COVID and she dies. The book of Job is in the Bible to keep us from thinking that way. Job's friends come along and say, Job, nobody suffers the way you're suffering unless God's getting him for something. Why don't you fess up? Maybe he'll take it away. Well, the first chapter of Job, we have that they didn't have. And the first chapter of Job says the devil didn't like the fact that Job was an upright man. And he said, I'm going to break his faith. And, and we can go back and talk later. Well, why didn't God just say, no, 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 you, you can't. Good people never suffer, and I'm, I'm not going to let them get COVID or cancer or, or lose their property. So Job is in the Bible to keep disciples from thinking the way these guys were thinking that day. They see a blind man. Here's their question. I wonder who sinned, this poor schmuck or his parents, that he's blind. And Jesus said, I wish you wouldn't talk that way. Hadn't you read the book of Job? Don't you know that's not the kind of God my father is? He doesn't make people blind. Nobody sinned that this guy is blind, period. Now, second subject. Because he is blind, people like us who have sight, maybe we can figure out something to do to make his life better uh, while it's still day. The night's coming when nobody can work. We're not going to be here much longer. I'm not going to be here much longer. Let's do something practical to try to help him. Now, that's not a full answer to the problem of pain and suffering, but it goes a long way down the line, to my mind anyway. Mm -hmm. Calvinism says everything that happens in the world happens because God wills it. I don't believe that. 90% of the headlines in my newspaper are about things that if I thought God was doing him, uh, doing them, I'd join the other team. Um, here, here's a nurse who's killed on the way to work at St. Thomas Hospital. Mm-hmm. Uh, here is a, a kid uh, who is stolen and trafficked for sex. Here, it, here's a double homicide uh, in a fight over drugs. If I believe that everything that happens in human experience is happening because God willed it, God God is a monster. I'm sorry. I don't mean to be blasphemous, but God's a monster. Those bad things happen because we humans have free will. We misuse our free will. We we have introduced sin into the human environment. We've introduced uh, crime and lies and all sorts of things. And with regard to to the person born blind or COVID, I don't think those trace directly to sin. I think they're just part of the suffering and the groaning that happen in a fallen world where natural law rather than miracle regulates the day-to-day operation of what happens in the world. Now, I've talked way too much, but, but I had to talk that much, I think, to lay out a thesis and especially uh, to, uh, to challenge the, the Calvinistic uh, translation of the King James Version and its heirs about John 9. This man didn't sin, so God could set up a miracle for Jesus. That'd be awful. This man was born blind due to tragic circumstances we don't know. And when Jesus comes across a blind man, his first thought is not, I wonder who sinned, but I wonder what kindness we can show him to make his life better. I think that's the question the church ought to ask in the face of COVID not wonder why God sent it. He didn't. But what do we do to help set things right? So you mentioned Calvin. And I went to a, I went to a seminary where Calvin was a big deal. So let me read this, uh, this one piece from a, a theology book. Um, Calvin, Calvin's doctrine of providence affirms God's governance over all events even more emphatically. Among his central aims is to oppose the idea that any event occurs by fortune, chance, or caprice. All events are governed by God's secret plan, says Calvin. 
nothing happens except what is knowingly and willingly decreed by God. Holding that it is insufficient to affirm a bare foreknowledge of God, Calvin declares that God governs the course of nature and history down to the smallest details. God directs everything by his incomprehensible wisdom and disposes it to his own end. Kind of a summation of, of Calvin's yep. position that every you know, everything is, is preordained and in, in down to the smallest yeah, detail. On, on Calvin's so, view of things, before you and I were born, God decided we'd be saved or lost. Right. And and our response to God has been dictated. We're, we're, we're puppets on a string or we're programmed computers. Uh, I'm convinced the Bible affirms that we're free. And that we make choices and, and we believe or we disbelieve and we're responsible for faith or unbelief because we made the choice. If, if God programmed it, I'm not responsible. Uh, anybody who goes into a court who kills somebody and if it turns out that he's been drugged, hypnotized and coerced by some evil genius, it's the person who set him up not the person who pulled the trigger or plunged the knife, who's going to be judged guilty of the crime. That this makes God a criminal. So, so here's what I hear from a lot of people, and I'm I'm with you on the uh, we have free will. We're we're a part of this unfolding drama in life, and our decisions matter, and and what we choose to do or not do makes a difference. A lot of people would say, well, it, you know, clearly uh, human beings do things that where we hurt each other or we stab each other in the back or we choose the opposite of love. Um, but people seem to have a much more difficult time with um, natural disasters, uh, earthquakes, tsunamis, uh, you know, childhood cancer, um, because they would say, well, that's not the, re the, the direct result of somebody not choosing the way of love or not choosing you know, what the way God wants us to be. Um, so they, they say, uh, you know, I can, I can accept that when I can say, yeah, this is because so-and-so sinned, they didn't do what was right. But, it, but when it comes to these, uh, you know, these natural disasters, it seems a lot more difficult to come to terms with. Um, how do you, how would you respond to that? Yeah. I think we have to distinguish two different kinds of what we call evil in the problem of evil. And, and so far we haven't really separated them out. Moral evil. Uh, I agree with you the the misuse of our free will, that's the easier part of Calvinism to respond to. If, if I get blotto drunk, get in a car, drive it onto the expressway and kill three people. I, my free will took me to the bar, got me blotto drunk, and my stupid decision under alcohol put me on the inner. That's moral evil. And, and there's culpability and blame in that moral blame. Natural evil is a child being born blind, like the John 9 story. Mm -hmm. Or, um, you know, an elderly person getting up in the middle of the night and tripping on a rug, breaking a hip. That, 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 that's not the misuse of freedom. That's an accident, uh, a tsunami, um, uh, an earthquake. Those are natural evils. Natural evil is different from moral evil in this regard. I think for the most part, they are random because we live in a world that operates under natural, what we call scientific law, natural law, illustration, gravity. Gravity works for saints and sinners. Um, gravity will make a sinner stumble and fall if he's careless and hit his head against the corner of the table, have a hematoma and die. It'll do the same thing for a godly saint. The laws of nature hold for everybody. And a tsunami, for example, or an earthquake happens because heat and cooling happen in the crust of the earth and plates move. And well, sinners die when earthquakes happen and saints don't. No, those natural laws cause effects in nature that, that hit all of us. Let me quote Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount. 
It rains on the just and the unjust, and the sun shines on good people and bad people. I think that's the, the beginning of the answer to the problem of natural evil, or, or why was this man born blind? Not because somebody sinned. Some unfortunate event in the natural process of embryonic development uh, today, uh, if a woman is in the very earliest stages of pregnancy, doesn't know she's pregnant, has a chest x-ray because the doctor thinks she has pneumonia, she may give birth to a severely deformed child. That's not a moral evil. That's just what x-rays do to early stage fetus. I had a student in college. Um, she died just a few years ago. Uh, she had no arms. She, she had not even buds. She had a little empty sockets. Her mother took thalidomide back in the 19, I don't know, 50s or so. Thalidomide was a um, sort of a sleep drug that doctors prescribed until several months later, children were being born without limbs and severely deformed. Um, th th there's not a moral evil in that. In ignorance, you take a medication in good faith that a doctor prescribed in good faith that had an unforeseen effect. It happens to saints and sinners alike. Natural law holds for everybody. Here's one of those passages, again, that I think gets misused. It's what, Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good to those who love the Lord and who are called according to his purpose. That verse doesn't say that everything that happens happens because God wills it to happen. It says in everything that happens, if you continue to trust God, love God, try to do right, God has the ability to work it for good. He didn't will that it happen. God, for example, didn't will that I have asthma or that my father have cancer. What God willed was, okay, Rubel, if you have asthma, be smart enough to be careful during COVID period. Uh, and when you are sick, don't blame God for it. Or when your dad dies of pancreatic cancer, and he did three and a half weeks after he was diagnosed with it, don't blame God for it. React in faith and say, God, um, bless my father not to suffer unduly. Um, receive him into your arms. Let him have peace in these last few days of his life. So it, it's a very different thing. Calvin, everything that happens happens because God is willing that it should happen. Mm -hmm. And in saying, no matter what happens, God has a will. Mm -hmm. What is God's will? Trust me. Uh, submit yourself uh, and surrender to me that I'm the good shepherd of your soul and trust me that I will love you and work good out of what happens in your life. That's what happened in John 9. And I think that's what is happening with COVID. A lot of bad things have come out of COVID-19. A few good things have come out of it because there are people who've responded to it unselfishly. Uh, first responders, doctors, nurses who've given of themselves. Some of them even, even have died. Mm -hmm. um, but God didn't do it. And God is not punishing the world for, if God wanted to punish the world, he wouldn't send COVID-19 that gets mostly elderly people in nursing homes. God would send a disease that affected mafia contract killers and pimps and people who kidnap and exploit children to traffic them. Uh, God could do a lot better job than COVID-19. Rubel, you might remember the book by Leslie Weatherhead uh, called The Will of God. It's kind yep. of a, a classic yep. book. He, yep. he talks about three different kinds. He says there's God's uh, intentional will. Then there's meaning what God has in mind. Then there's circumstantial will, which is what happens when fallen humans get involved. But ultimately, God can work through any situation to, to bring about God's ultimate will. And so even in the midst of horrible situations, even in the midst of pandemics or uh, cancer, I mean, look at, you know, look at what uh, Tolu is, is dealing with right now. And yet she could sit there in the sanctuary and give uh, such a meaningful message a couple of weeks ago uh, that, that would inspire and, and, and help everybody else. And so the, basically the circumstantial will happens, but, it, but God ultimately, you know, gets God's way, even though uh, I would say that we all do things that surprise God. 
Yeah, Weatherhead's book, I've given it to people, recommend it to people. It, it's, it's a good book. The, the, I, th I think the, the great mistake in Calvinism is the misunderstanding of sovereignty. Sovereignty doesn't mean that God is making everything happen that occurs in human history. Sovereignty means that no matter what happens in human, human history, it's going to land where God has said it's going to land. Where is that? God is going to bring his sons and daughters to glory. Those who have trusted Christ, lived in faith, he's going to reward them. Um, and, and that may come in the life to come much more so than in this life. For most of us, it certainly will. And evil will not win and lies will not triumph over truth. And Satan will not have the final word about um, any of the outcomes of our lives, our children or things that are valuable. So sovereignty has to do with ultimate outcomes, not every step along the way. So one of the questions that I'm thinking about, uh, one of the sad parts about this pandemic period, as I see it, is that it's, it's put all of us into a uh, kind of a survival mode. One, trying to just not get sick so people don't go out and they, you know, they kind of keep to themselves. But also, I, I do think that to a large degree, a lot of the things that we would do to serve other people, at least at our church, it, you know, we don't do out of fear of getting the virus. So we would, you want to host room in the inn during the winter. Well, you know, you can't, we're not doing room in the inn right now. You want to go out and build a habitat house. Well, you can't do that and be around other people. You want to go to fall Hamilton and, and tutor kids at our, uh, our partner school. Well, you can't do that because the kids are learning, you know, uh, remotely. Um, yeah. What, what would you say, uh, are, what are we being called to do in the midst of this? What are we called to do individually as Christians, but also uh, as a church, we talked last week about the idea of checking with the cul-de-sac and saying, I'm going to the grocery store. Who needs something? You know, and, and, and bring it back, checking with your neighbor and saying, how can I help you? But there are ways to be, uh, you know, Christians and disciples in the midst of this. And I think that sometimes we're not, you know, being creative enough. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure that's true. And as a non-creative person, uh, I'm, I'm probably the last person in the room to be asked this question. Um, let me give you the first answer that, that may aggravate you and, and a lot of us who are pastors with churches and whatever. Uh, I have been dismayed that people like John Piper and others, uh, he's in California, and of course, some of the rules there are different from here that when a state government or a governor or a mayor says, look, the pandemic is spreading so rapidly and the numbers are so bad, we want no groups larger than 25. Well, Piper said, multi-thousand member church, God wants us to come to church and we're, we're gonna get them together and God's gonna protect them and it's gonna be the will. I think that's really sorry. Um, if if somebody needs to be inconvenienced because there's a pandemic spreading, I think Christians ought to put our hands up first and say, well, let us be the first ones to be inconvenient. Um, we, we, we are not going to say, make us an exemption. Uh, you can't have basketball game for the kids, can't have school for fourth graders, but, but, but we Christians by George, we've got to be able to be an exemption and we can meet in a hundred or a thousand or 10,000 and we can wear masks if we want to and we don't have to. I think that's very selfish and very arrogant. Number one, churches should be the first people to say, hey, if somebody needs to be inconvenienced and if somebody needs to step to the back of the room here to give everybody more breathing space, we want to go first. Number two, churches certainly ought to make our facilities available. You said, hey, if, if they would give COVID shots in central Nashville, we'll give you space at Woodmont Christian. You know, we'll have a, uh, we'll have a blood drive. We'll have a COVID vaccine station. We'll do this. We'll help fund it. We'll, our members will step up. We have nurses, um, physicians that they'll do the injection. Certainly, we ought to do things like that. So, so the first thing is the one that I think a lot of churches have made jackasses out of ourselves. Um, that, yeah, I know, can't have school, can't have big gatherings, but we're going to have church, 
and will put people at risk. And of course, th there have been Catholic churches that have had spreads because in, in the Mass and the Eucharist, a, a priest who had COVID, I, I think, gave it, what, 54 parishioners uh, yeah, in, in, one in one group of about 200 people. Happens in Protestant groups, too, so I'm not, sure. not, picking on, not picking on them. So first thing, Christians ought to not buck and rear and say, don't make us be inconvenienced. Uh, love for my neighbor says, I'm willing to be inconvenienced for the neighbor. Then number two, we should look for ways to maintain community. Church is community. Um, I, I'm not a Lone Ranger Christian. Um, I, I, I need my brothers and sisters. Zoom is good. I miss handshakes. I miss hugs. I miss high-fiving and back-slapping. Um, but right now, I, I'm going to do the best I can, and I'm going to make a few extra phone calls. Uh, I might even do something that's a lost art. I might even write a note to somebody. Um, I might I might send something through Amazon or Kroger click list or whatever to help somebody. Um, and the kinds of things that we talked about last week, your missionary to your neighborhood. Um, third, you know, sort of ticking on down the list. I think churches probably should poll our own members because given where you are in Nashville, given somebody who's more in the suburb toward Brentwood or given where somebody is down on, you know, fourth Avenue area, the needs of the community that the church could serve in a crisis might be very different. But, but by polling members and finding out what are the greatest needs in the part of the town where we are, uh, just get the creative minds of folks in the church, medical personnel, not medical personnel, people who know how to organize to do some of those things and, and to do them well to, to serve the community. And of course, I, I don't mean to belittle by, by making this fourth, fifth, sixth down the list. Christians ought to pray and fast uh, for the people that we're concerned about. Uh, who are sick, neighbors who aren't Christians, neighbor who's a Muslim, uh, somebody from our church. Um, I, I really do believe that God hears prayers. And if I pray about cancer and pray about heart disease, I'll, I'll pray about COVID-19 as well. And, um, and make sure that, that I help folks get the vaccine if I need to do the driving for them to get them there and mask up to do it. So, Rubel, out of respect for our uh, our governor and our mayor, we've been we've been virtual again for about a month. But yeah. I want everybody to know that starting this weekend, we're going to be back at nine fifteen and ten thirty, and we're doing that to make sure everybody can spread out. I would come yeah. back at that saying, I do believe that there are safe ways to gather, uh, yeah. socially distanced and spread out. However, I agree with you that this idea of the government can't tell me what to do or our church what to do, you know, it really flies in the face of, of you know, love your neighbor, love your neighbor exactly. as you love yourself. One of the things that we, we, we started to talk about last week and that I think is a, a, a problem is um, just the fact that so many people count on church as their primary social connection. Yeah, and the, and I think the people that have done the best during this pandemic, and I was talking to our staff today. How can we start more small groups? How can we start more small groups? You know, the people that have done the best have been in the Sunday school class or the small group or attended classes yeah. like this. But there's still so many people that are were already lonely, and now the one point of connection that they have to touch other human beings and to be in, in the present company. You know, has been taken away, or at least they've been discouraged. To some go. of them don't have technology, or or sure. are not comfortable using it, and so that's not a good answer for them. Right, that's right. And so, you know, how can you help people figure out what Zoom looks like, or or get them the equipment that they need to set that up? Even though I think, at least in our church, uh, folks have come a really, really long way uh, in in terms of getting to use the technology, but. But See, that's why God sent COVID-19. It was to get people <laughs> technologically literate. No, no. Right. And, and by right. the way, let, let me clarify. I, I didn't make this point about we ought to volunteer to cooperate. That was in no means critical of, of the way you guys are doing it. I'm preaching for a church now out in Brentwood, the Harpeth Hills Church of Christ, that they're having four services on Sunday. 
so they can spread out the membership and socially distance right. and uh, mask and, and do all of the things appropriate. But again, if, if the governor were to say, um, you know, here's some sort of mandate, right. um, I, I would stop preaching there if the elders said, well, we're going to go to court and challenge it. We're going right. to keep, we're going to put our people at risk, even though right. the best science says for the next 30 days, there should be no assemblies larger than 10. But while we're on the topic, Rubel, can you comment on uh, governors or political leaders uh, saying that liquor stores and other things can remain open, but churches need to close? Ain't that weird. Is that all you I got? Mean, that, I mean, what, what, what else do you say to that? Uh, to, to say the, the things that, that are essential are the liquor stores mm -hmm. and and school for the kids and and church uh, where people are being responsible and careful and sober uh, that they need to shut down. Now the 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 inequities of the way some of the limitations are laid out just has to do with human stupidity. Um, I, I don't know what to say to that except some of the rules have just been really stupid. Yeah. Um, well, speaking of inequities, one of the things that's really well documented during this time, we, all, we already knew that there was a gap in our culture between the haves and the have nots. Well, one of the things that we all know is, is that COVID has exacerbated that gap, right? There are people who have been able to, to get PPP money. They've been able to have money in the stock market. There's other people that haven't been able to work or get, you know, th that is only going to make this divide there is making that divide greater in our culture. And, um, and, and, and I think that that's something that we all, you know, have to really think about and wrestle with. Um, I don't think the answer is a certain, you know, uh, a political platform or tax policy, but the reality that there are some people that have soared through this pandemic and are doing just fine and other people that, you know, are, are going to food banks is true. And, um, and so there's a real opportunity, uh, you know, for Christians, for churches to step up and meet some of those needs. And Woodmont has, but there's more we can do. Yeah. Yeah. I, a number of churches that I know and that I've been involved with personally are doing what Woodmont's doing. Uh, for those of us who still have jobs, still have income, can still give, we've set aside amounts of money to help the people who lost their jobs. Uh, the, the restaurant closed, you know, the service worker, the restaurant closes. So the person who was a cook or the person who was uh, a waiter or waitress, they lose their job. They're going to lose the apartment. They've got, they've got two children. Well, we, we step in and we help and we, we underwrite them through a difficult time. Uh, I think that's more the duty of the church than it's the responsibility of government. Um, I'm, I'm not opposed to government programs that, that defer uh, rent payment or student loans, but I'd much rather God get the glory for Woodmont Christian helping three of your members who otherwise would not have an apartment or would be uh, unable to take care of the children's needs or a few weeks back to have had a even a responsible sort of Christmas program for the kids. Um, that's God's people's duty before it's Uncle Sam's duty. So thank you for what you do. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, okay, we're going to, in just a couple minutes, we're going to open it up for, for uh, questions and, and, and uh, comments. But I am, in, I am thinking one of the points of this class tonight, we wanted to kind of wrestle with some of the theology and ask the, you know, the, you know, the question, where is God and why is this happening and, and what is God doing in the midst of this pandemic? And I think God is doing a lot in the midst of, of the pandemic through frontline workers, through churches, through all, through all of us. Um, how do you, Rubel, see this, you know, permanently changing, uh, you know, Christianity and church culture? In other words, once we get through this and enough people have been able to get the vaccine to where they can come back to church, what is going to be different? Clay, I'm not smart enough to give you a good answer. 
to that question. I, I think those of us who are thinking six months a year, we're going to get back to normal. I don't think we'll ever be back to what we were a year ago, or five years ago. History doesn't function that way and life doesn't function that way. Um, some things are changed and they're changed permanently. Number one, I, I think churches like Woodmont, like Harpeth Hills Church I'm working with, we've invested in technology we didn't have a year ago. We haven't learned yet how to use it terribly well. Woodmont Christian does better than Harpeth Hills. Um, and we have a long way to go to learn to use all of that investment and how to staff a church uh, so that we use communication techniques more effectively than, than we currently know how to do it. But it's going to be, um, it's going to be something very different in terms of an emphasis on, you talked earlier about small groups. We need to remember that the earliest church was house churches. You know, it, it, it wasn't 500 church, uh, member churches. It wasn't mega churches of 12 and 15,000 with nine locations. It was church in Corinth was four people in this house and seven people in that house. And it was, it was small groups. So even where you have a large church like Woodmont Christian or Harpeth Hills or whatever it may be, the, the bigger you get, the smaller you're going to have to become in terms of meaningful associations. Carl George says, and he's a church consultant. Some of you may have heard of him, doesn't matter. He says, unless a person has six friends in a church within 12 months of joining it, they will, they will not continue with that church. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if that's a hard and fast rule, but I get the point of that. Church needs to be something more than I show up, I come in, I sit nine rows from the front, I drop in a few dollars, and I leave. Church ought to be community. I'm not going to know every member of the church I attend, even if I'm the pastor. I, I'm not going to know the name of every person who comes through that door. But if I don't, number one, make the effort to meet a few people, you know, come a little early, stay a little late, go to one of the potlucks, do something, go to a Bible class— if I don't make an effort to get to know a few, and if the people who've been there in a while, uh, been there a while, don't open up their class, let's let it be a class, not a click, to let the new person in, to get to know them, to invite them out to, to the Thursday night dinner that a couple of our families are going on. So the, the notion of small groups, formal or informal, to where people can make a handful of meaningful friends uh, everybody's got stuff going on in their life. Um, I've, I've got heart disease. Uh, I've got a child who's, you know, dealing with addiction. I've, I've, my, my aunt uh, is in the nursing home. All of us have stuff. We need somebody to talk to about that, to debrief with, and somebody to care about, pray about, maybe even go visit the aunt in the nursing home and say, well, not today, but when, when we get past the COVID restrictions. Um, if you don't make a few friends, form a small group, Zoom, whatever, um, the, the church is not going to serve those people, and those people are not going to connect with the church. So one of the ways that, that COVID is changing us is, is to make us realize, hey, it was neat coming together on Sunday morning, but I needed more than that anyway. I needed a few friends. Oh, keep going, Ruby. Keep going. All right. So um, th th that's definitely uh, going going to change. That we're the need's always been there, but I think some of us are more aware of it now. Mm -hmm. I think those of us who are pastors are going to maybe get over some of our ego issues. That it's about you coming and liking my sermon. No. Yep. It's about me helping you connect with one another mm -hmm. and find ways to minister uh, out of this church and through this church and be ministered to if you get into a crisis situation. Um, church is not about the center stage and who's on it. It's about all of us who are in the pews um, needing to connect with one another for the sake of representing Jesus to one another. This is the uh, newest staffer family member. This is Bayer. 
He's eight weeks old. So looks a lot said, like so. the looks a lot like the dad in the house. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's try around see the eyes. I love really Ruble. Next week, I'd love for us to talk uh, about fear and the role that fear uh, has played and continues to play in what is a you know the Bible tells us that we're not to live in fear. Jesus tells us to fear not. But yet, how do we balance fear with being responsible? Ooh. Um, yeah. But right now, I want to kind of pivot to uh, some questions. I see that Cyril uh, posted a question, says, Ruble, do you have spiritual practices that help with the anxiety uh, during COVID time? So let's start with that question. Then we got some more. Yeah, Cyril. And, and I, I like the idea of talking about fear next week. Um, Cyril, I'm, I'm sort of a, a bookish, schoolish person. I read scripture and pray. I don't journal constantly, but during periods that I feel particular stress, I journal. I go to Staples and I buy me a composition book and I write a page a day about what I believe God is needing for me to hear that day or what I am needing to tell God and I either feel embarrassed or shy or reluctant or confused enough that I don't know how to get it out to him. So the, the, the traditional spiritual disciplines of scripture and prayer joined with journaling, writing. I, I, I've always believed since I was a student, at least in college, maybe high school, I can't get my head around anything that I can't reduce to writing. And Clay knows me well enough to know when I'm trying to figure something out, I'll try to write it down in a, you know, 500 to 750 words and run it by Clay or run it by Tom Eddins or run it by Jason Pagel and say, does this make sense? Um, and, and can we talk about this and help me sharpen on it? So scripture, prayer and writing are the spiritual disciplines, Cyril, that serve me well. Um, Yep. What about you? What about some of the others of you in class? Any other thoughts on spiritual disciplines or practices that you found very helpful during COVID? I can mention one other that I've practiced that I don't think it was a spiritual discipline. I think it was just sort of a nausea. Um, you know, fasting is not always from food. I have fasted from social media mm. in, in the last <laughs> year because it is so toxic and, and especially during the, the, the presidency just ending, we're, we're tweeting and Facebooking and uh, whatever you said, somebody came after you that, oh, you must be a left winger, you must be a right winger, you must be this, you must be that. Uh, I, I didn't just fast from it, I cut off from it completely um, because it, it was unhealthy for me to, yeah. to be subjected to it. Yeah, I still make the case that the downside of social media outweighs the upside. There is an upside. Yeah. It does yeah. connect us. Well, the downside of social downside. media is the anti-social folks who yeah. no, that's right. see that as, as a way to vent their anger. Yeah, Cyril said prayer walks. Yeah, I, I, I find, yeah. you know, walking, exercising, people getting outside in their neighborhoods, you know, uh, the, the, you know getting the blood flowing, uh, especially when the weather's nicer. Uh, that makes a big difference when you're when you're cooped up inside and when you're not going out to your usual uh, places to begin with. Um, OK, uh, Roy, you had a question, I think. I wanted to go back to the where we started with the theological discussion on on uh, the man born blind. And I first want to say that I'm, I'm glad that Rubel's been hanging out with me enough now. That he answered that uh, uh, Calvinism versus free will, just as he knows I would answer it, and I, I agree with that. But the question that I want to ask, a little different thought, is what does it say about us or about anybody who looks at COVID or any tragedy or crisis that happens, and, and they say, you know, why did God let this happen, or where is God, and why didn't God stop this, versus people that would say, isn't that marvelous the way God is in those frontline workers? Isn't that marvelous the way God is acting in the midst of this? What does it say about us and the way we react to these crises? Yeah, or, or maybe another way of reacting is the way Jesus reacted. We're asking the wrong questions, try to figure out 
where to come from. You know, if the scientist or somebody needs to figure that out or the, or the detective, it's a criminal thing. My question is, is there anything that I could do right now to help? If the person is a victim, uh, can I use my tie to create a tourniquet? Or can I use my car to get them to the hospital because there doesn't seem to be an ambulance available? Or can I give some money uh, to this family that their house is burned to make sure they have hotel room for the next three nights? I can't put them up forever, but I've, I've got enough points in my Hilton travel uh, account. I know I can put them up for three or four nights um, just for the taxes that it would cost me on that. So I think you're right. We, we want somebody to blame. I think is our sort of our human nature. When something bad happens, who do I blame? Well, when something bad happens, another question is, who could I help? Um, uh, and back to Cyril's question about spiritual disciplines, I'm not sure this really counts as a spiritual discipline, but years ago I read and I try to practice it. Every time I hear a siren, and you can't always tell if it's police or a fire truck, whatever, I try to remember to pray. God, that siren is not going off unless somebody were in trouble. Mm -hmm. Somebody's being transported to the heart uh, to the hospital with a heart attack. Somebody's house is on fire. A uh, policeman is going to be in jeopardy because crime is in progress. Lord, whatever's going on, uh, be there and foster righteousness and protect the innocent and and let let good come out of what right now must seem like only bad to the people who are involved. Um, learning to, to let things trigger prayer. Uh, maybe that's an expansion of prayer as a spiritual discipline, but to, to try to react, not so much uh, to go and be a gawker, Roy, to get back to that point, but to say, Lord, let me pray for whoever is in jeopardy there for you to bless them. And if you can show me a way to help them, for you to lead me to that point. Well, just quickly, another way you raise another example that when you hear a siren, what is your immediate thought? Somebody's been hurt or somebody's being helped? Yeah, yeah. Well, and I would say to the question, I mean, we're, we're not very good. We're not very good at being inconvenienced. Uh, we have life the way we want it. We get used to you it. That's how we yeah. want it. And yeah. so, Are you as selfish as I am? I don't want to be inconvenient. <laughs> I don't want to wear so a mask. I, I, I don't well, want to and, have my routine interrupted. I, I found this the serenity prayer, uh, you know, to be yeah. very uh, relevant here to, you know, yeah. control the things you can, let go of the things you can. I found that helpful individually. I've and also the found that helpful. What's the difference? Yeah. That's right. Uh, right. As a pastor, um, Martha Hobby uh, typed a question that said, you know, she hasn't been able to see the young people and that the, she doesn't see a lot of young people on this call. Martha, there's some. Um, that are on here. A lot of them might be putting uh, kids to bed. So it could be a timing thing more than anything, but uh, you know, how can we get more, you know, opportunities for, uh, you know, the mixing of the generations. And that's something that we just need to work on. Uh, and um, you know, but yeah, you're right. Uh, this is, the, this, this is a, a an average, uh, not a young people class, but, um, but it probably, has to do with topic. I don't know. Um, uh, I think we got some on here, though. Other questions uh, for this for tonight for Ruble. Put your hand up or uh, put it in the uh, in the in the chat. And I'm trying to um, okay. I'm trying to uh, look across as we go here. It could be on anything that we've covered. Hey Ruble, um, a good friend of mine who uh, went back and he went. He was in business and he went to seminary and he's in the ministry now he mentioned um a scripture about how christians are called to gather and worship even in in spite of danger i'm not sure i texted him earlier hoping he'd tell me what verse he was referring to but have you heard that much or he's probably talking about hebrews 10 25 i mean hebrews is in the context of some christians perhaps mm -hmm. facing persecution or first peter and 1025 says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhort each other, encourage each other uh, as you see this, the jeopardy approaching. Um, I, again, remember what those Christian assemblies were. They were four or five people. 
two families that, that lived close enough to each other. Some of them, they could meet clandestinely, you know, you, especially when you get over to the second and, and early third Christian centuries, it's illegal to be Christian or in uh, North Korea today uh, that they, they can't have great big assemblies. They have to have surreptitious private. So yeah, I, I would say those scriptures are misapplied when I use them to say, I've got a 3,000 member church here and I'm not going to change our routines and the kids are going to go to class and we don't have to wear masks. And those are your secular rules and God's going to take care of us. Uh, I think I might ha quote what Jesus said to the devil. Now, be, be careful about tempting the Lord your God. You know, Jesus. Uh, so, yeah, th there are biblical injunctions about the importance of community and worship and assembly but it misuses them to say that we therefore can sort of throw caution to the wind uh, and good science and medical practice to the wind and not social distance or, or, or say everybody else has to go with those rules. But if we do this in Jesus name, we'll all be protected. None of us are going to get sick. Thank you. Other, que other questions. Uh, I see if, uh, Faye, TV ball. I'd just like to ask, most Christians believe that God is in charge of what goes on here on our earth. And how does this fit with what we've been talking about? Yeah. Is he really in charge when he's not responsible for any of this? How does that fit? Yeah, I, 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 think, I think we're, this is one of those mixing categories things. Sovereignty means history is going to land where God has said it's going to land. Righteousness is going to prevail. Truth will out. The saints of God will be vindicated. But that's very different from saying day to day to day, God is in control of how this saint is being treated, or he won't let anybody tell a lie, or that if a lie is told, God willed that that should be told. The, the control of God is not the control over our free will to negate it. The control of God is things will never be so out of control that history will fail to reach the end that God has ordained. What's that end? The purpose of God is to bring sons and daughters to glory. The purpose of God is to prepare a new heaven and a new earth for those who love righteousness to live in that ideal environment again. No, he's not in control of the mafia, Don, who says, these are the three people I want you to have murdered by midnight tonight. Um, that, that, that is the abuse of the freedom that God has given human beings. But when all said and done, the mafia Don fails and the righteous people of God triumph. It's sort, it's sort of like the message of the book of Revelation. God's people are going to win in the end. In the meanwhile, they are paying a very high price. Faye, uh, something my dad shared with me years ago that I've always found is a helpful uh, a metaphor on that is if you love your children, if you're a parent, and you love your children, it doesn't mean that you lock your children up and don't let them live their life. You know, you let them live their life. And with that, that brings risk. And they're going to do things that will surprise you and things that you may not have predicted. But control is not love. And if we believe in a loving God, then that doesn't mean that God controls. You know, we, we have a role to play in this unfolding drama. But uh, yeah, eschatolo eschatologically, it's going to be okay. Uh, it's going to all land where it's supposed to land. But that, you know, I've always asked the question, you know, do we do things that surprise God? I would say yes, <laughs> uh, but we're allowed to do them. Uh, I've found that. Well, I would even go further. Do we th do things that God doesn't want us to do? Right. Yeah. Yes. And that are against his will. Yeah. Yes. It's all sin. Right. And, and it, if these things were being done because God willed them, they would not be sin. Uh, it would be the inevitable outcome of what God has caused me to do. So, yeah, I mean, you, your question is so good and so on point. We use language like, well, God's in charge. 
Well, of outcomes, yes, but not of process because we humans keep throwing monkey, monkey wrenches into the process. Mm. And it's, it, it is a matter of, well, w sayings like this one, everything happens for a purpose. No, it doesn't. The word accident is in the dictionary because some things are just freaky accidents. Uh, not everything that happens is purposeful, but in everything that happens, I can find a purpose, and that is to try to honor God in this freaky thing that happens. Uh, a tie rod breaks on my car, and my car throws me, and I, I break an arm. I'm not going to blame God for that. Car accidents happen. Tires blow out in curves. But I do believe in that event, the will of God is that I react appropriately, not blame God, not try to sue an innocent person who happened to be going by at the time. And I hit their fender, but I get me a, an unscrupulous lawyer that sues him for half a million dollars. Um, a lot of things that have uh, most things I would argue that happen in the world are like Jesus says, it rains on the just and the unjust, sun shines on good people and bad people. Most things that happen are random, but it, even in the random things, the will of God is that I continue to trust him, do what's right as his disciple, love my neighbor as I love myself, and put God first. And then in the end, God will show that he's in control and it will end where it should. And if I die a martyr, as lots of folks have. I probably won't. Um, it's okay. At the end, it lands where God wants it to land. That person is raised and given a, a table or given a seat at the table of God uh, in the banquet hall of eternity. That's just not a bad fate. All right, I see uh, Ann Cooper has her hand up. One thing, and I've thought it all through my life, but especially the last year when all these churches were, oh, we're going to have these services. God gave us brains. Use them. Well, use them, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. I mean, he obviously gave the healthcare workers and the nurses, the first responders, the talents to help us don't make their jobs any more difficult than they Absolutely. have to be. That's I'm with you. Point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me see. I'm looking through other, other questions for tonight. Um, Rubel, I have a question that I'd love that, that I'd love. And then to I want to close with on. one final text. After okay. All right. Good. So this, this is, a, um, is it offensive to call it the China virus? And that's not a, that's not a politically loaded question. I just, uh, there's a lot of discussion about that. What, what, why, you know, see people say it was the Spanish flu. It was the, you know, is it or is it? Offensive it wasn't Spanish, it? yeah, in terms of charge. No, I, I, I call it COVID-19. I have never used that term of it. Mm -hmm. The fact that a given disease is first isolated in Russia or China or Kansas does not mean that that is the source of, or somebody in that place had a sinister intent. Why do that? Um, th there are enough sort of supercharged ways of referring to other people or um, using ethnic, cultural, prejudicial terms. Call it what it is. It's COVID-19. Um, it's coronavirus identified in 2019, COVID-19 for shorthand, um, call it by its scientific name and let it go with that. Okay. Um, so I'll let you close this out. We'll have one more week. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about fear, the role that fear is playing, yeah. how we overcome it, anxiety. And then yeah, uh, next week, I get to ask the questions and you have to be the one to sit there and answer. Okay. It's more fun this way. More fun this no. way. All right. <laughs> All right. Close this out, Rubel. Here's the text. Now, on this larger issue of, look, problem of evil, we live, we, we say we worship a good and loving God. We live in a world that we say he created, and, and why all the mess in the world? I sometimes take young people to this text to answer that question. 
It's Matthew 13, where Jesus gives the parable of the wheat and the weeds. And I won't read the parable. I'll just go down to the interpretation of it. This begins at 37. Jesus said, the person who sowed good seed is the son of man, and the field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom, and the weeds are the people of the evil one. And the enemy who sows them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are the angels. Now, his story was this. A good man prepared a good field and sowed good seed, and when it began to grow, his servants came and said, there are weeds growing in your wheat, uh, in your wheat. What in the world is going on? Well, that seems to me has been our question tonight. A good God who creates a good world and puts people in it in its own, in his own image. You'd expect it to run better than this one is running, but weeds pop up. Yeah. They're COVID-19. There's cancer. There's crime. There's immorality. Jesus has the story going this way. The servants say, do you want us to go out in the field and pull the weeds up? He said, no, don't do that, because if you pull up weeds, you're going to uproot the wheat, and it'll all die. You just have to let it grow together until the end, and then we'll separate it. The owner's servant came and said, sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where did the weeds come from? The master replied, an enemy did this. Well, in the interpretation of the parable, Jesus said, the enemy is Satan. The enemy is the devil. The enemy is the liar and the deceiver. So there is a good God who created a good world and put men and women in it who are in his own image and likeness. But God has this enemy who lies, deceives, and tries to undo God's work who has sowed all these other things out here that causes our heartache and our grief. So unlike these servants, we don't say, hey, master of the field, why did you sow weeds in it? God didn't sow the weeds. He has an enemy. Every untruth, every lie, every evil intent, everything that comes from the evil one. Um, and I want to give him the blame rather than God for the fact that there are a lot of things that happen in this world that cause us grief. I can take those to God and ask for comfort, but I don't want to go to God and blame him for it. All right. Um, Ruben, will you close us in prayer? Next week will be our last uh, class on this series. And then two weeks from tonight, uh, Dr. David Kidd, who was the pastor at uh, 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 Hillsborough Press for many years, is going to lead a two-week class, Roy. Is that correct? Um, which will lead us up right before Wednesday, uh, Ash Wednesday. So Ruble and I will go one more week, and then David Kidd is going to join us uh, the first two weeks in uh, February. So uh, close us out, Ruble, in prayer, if you would. Lord God, I thank you for my brothers and sisters at Woodmont Christian who uh, have chosen to be part of this time together for dialogue and discussion, for thinking and reflecting. Thank you for the focus of it being scripture and theology to try to think your thoughts after you. And God, some of the questions that we ask are questions to which our puny little, or at least my puny little mind is never going to get a fully satisfactory answer. But help us in asking our questions to begin with the only one true answer that we have to know that you are the one true God that we love with heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we want to honor you. We want to do your will. We want to be your people in the world. So against all the hurt and the grief, the anguish, personal baggage that we're having to drag around from day to day, this pandemic, um, political, social tensions, all sorts of things that bother us and sometimes even rob us of our sleep. Let us believe not that you're behind those things to cause the chaos, but that your control will see to it that history comes to the end that you have dictated. And that when we stand before you and when we are confessing the name of Jesus, that we will hear him confess our name before you. And we look forward to being in uh, your forever home and being your people 
to give you honor and glory in the new heavens and the new earth where only righteousness will dwell and where these unsettling things that are caused by sin will no longer have place. Thank you for the promises. Help us to hold to them in deep faith is our prayer through Christ. Amen.